Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. Let's talk about how things are actually done most commonly today then. Back in the early 2000s, a lot of industry experts predicted that everybody would be using IPv6 within a few years because of a shortage of IPv4 addresses. But it hasn't actually worked out that way. And in today's networks, most enterprises are actually using RFC 1918 IPv4 addresses with NAT. So if you go and you work for a company, the chances are you're going to see something very similar to the previous slide where you're using private IP addresses and all of your inside hosts and you're translating them to the public IP address on the outside when they go out to the internet. Reasons for this are RFC 1918 actually has a security benefit of hiding your inside hosts by default because those private IP addresses are not routable on the internet. If you send traffic to a private IP address and it gets out to the internet, the internet router is just going to drop that traffic. Okay, so your private IP addresses, you can route between your hosts on the inside network and you can route between your hosts over your own wide area network, but you cannot send traffic to a private IP address on the internet because all the different companies are using those private IP addresses, the internet would not know which one to send it to. So they're for internal use within the organization only. Another reason that there's been a slower than expected uptake of IPv6 is that IPv6 address format is completely different. We've actually got a section that focuses on IPv6 later and you're going to see that, but it's completely alien to the IPv4 format. And all of the network engineers that are around today are very, very comfortable with IPv4. They're used to working with it day in and day out, but a lot of them are not comfortable with working with IPv6 because their organization isn't using it yet. So if you go and speak to one of these engineers and say, hey, we need to convert to IPv6, they're probably not going to be too keen on the idea because it's something completely new for them. They're already comfortable with IPv4 and they can give you the answer. Well, we're already using private addresses and that. It's not causing any issues. Everything's working just fine. So why put all the time, effort and money into converting IPv6? So that's why it's been slower for everybody on the internet to move over to IPv6 than was originally expected. But... IPv6 is still found in a lot of places, mostly in service provider networks. The majority of service provider networks will support both IPv4 and IPv6. You'll also see it being used for mobile services, like on your mobile phone, because there's lots of mobile phones and they're a relatively newer technology. So IPv6 was already out, there was already the shortage of IPv4 addresses. So for mobile services, they're mostly on IPv6. Where you'll also see it is in larger countries, which had a later adoption of the internet, such as India and China. Okay, last thing, spare public IPv4 addresses were exhausted in 2011, so IPv6 is still the future path. So you see that most companies today are using the RFC 1918 addresses and NAT, but it will slowly move over to IPv6. Other points, you still need to understand subnetting. So don't think, oh, well, if we are if we don't have that IPv4 address space problem, why did I have to spend all that time in this section learning about subnetting? You're still going to do subnetting even when you're using private IP addresses on the inside because you still need to do your logical addressing. And you also need to be able to understand and to troubleshoot IP. So everything that you have learned in this section is very applicable to the real world and also, of course, for passing your CCNA exam. Because we have the entire private IP address space to work with, it's common to see 
today's real world enterprises using slash 24 subnets for their end hosts, a slash 30 for a point to point link, and a slash 32 for the loopbacks. Remember, we'll talk about loopbacks more later. They're not complicated anyway, it's just a management address on the router or the switch. Complex VSLM. So remember we did that VSLM lesson earlier where I gave you the scenario and I said work out what the subnet mask sizes will be for the different departments in New York and Boston and say where the network addresses are going to begin at. That would be complex VLSM where we've got one subnet and we're dividing it up into smaller subnets with different size subnet masks. And it's quite complicated when you do that to because you have to think, okay, well, where does the actual network portion of the address begin and end? What's the broadcast address, etc.? If you're using a slash 24, it's super obvious. You just look at it and you know that up to the end of the third octet is the network address and the fourth octet is the host address. So it's very simple to use a clash 24. When we're using private addresses on the inside, we don't have the problem with a lack of IP addresses. We can use the entire private address space. So it's very common to use a slash 24 just because it's the easiest thing to do. And easy is good because it makes less mistakes and it makes troubleshooting easier. Where you will see VLSM being used is if an organization is actually using public IP addresses on the inside, which does sometimes still happen, and they need to maximize the use of their public IP addresses because they don't want to pay, they don't want to waste any because they're paying for them, then you might see more complex VL, VLSM being used in that kind of scenario. Okay, this is the last thing to tell you here about using contiguous addresses. So when you are using private addresses on the inside, like you see here, you're still going to want to do route summarization for the same reasons that we spoke about when we did the CIDR lecture earlier, which is that you're going to compartmentalize the different parts of your network. From one part of your network to a different part of your network, you're only going to send a summary address rather than every single route. So the example here, we've got region A on the left, and it's using 10.0.0 slash 24, 10.0.1 slash 24, etc., up to 10.0.255.0 slash 24. Region B within the same organization on the right is using 10.1.0, 10.1.1, and so on. We connect the two routers between region A and region B. And from region A, we can advertise 10.0.0.0 slash 16. And from region B to region A, we advertise 10.1.0.0 slash 16. So rather than advertising all 255 or 56 routes in both directions, we only advertise one route. So it takes up less memory on the routers because we've got less routes that are known to the routers. And also if there's a problem, the impact stays local to that particular region. So to be able to do this, you need to be careful with the way that you plan your network addressing, and you need to make sure that you allocate them in contiguous blocks like you see here. A mistake would be doing it like you see here. So here on the left, I've got 10.0.0, 10.1.0, then 10.0.2, and then 10.1.3. And on the right, I've got 10.1.0, 10.0.1, etc. So I'm mixing up my 10.0s and my 10.1s. So because of this, I can't advertise 10.0 from left to right because some of the 10.0s are already in the right. If you made a mistake with your network address planning like has been done here, you would need to advertise all of the routes everywhere. That's going to end up taking a lot more resources in your routers and it's going to make the network a lot less stable and harder to troubleshoot. So be careful when you're doing your network addressing design and carefully plan it out at the start and make sure that your addressing is done in contiguous blocks so that you can do your summarization. Okay, that's it. That is us done on the IP addressing and the subnetting. I just have one more lecture to tell you where you can find additional resources. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.